Basis is a series for the researcher. Previously, we have featured many who have discussed mind control. Now we travel to Norway to seek experienced, qualified medical opinion on mind control and other matters with retired chief medical officer from Finland, Rauni Lena Lukanin Kilda. We join Rauni in her home in Sun in southern Norway. Uh, we are in Sun. And who did we interview uh, earlier, Rauni? Yes, and uh, for uh, basis last five. Night, uh, you did a wonderful interview with Rauni Lena Lukan Kilde, which is the Finnish doctor who's written several books about UFO, about eternal life, and also the latest one about mind control. And I believe that's what this interview is about. It is. We join Rauni in her home in Sun in southern Norway. During the interviews and afterwards in London, sections of the interviews were actively deleted or damaged by sources or persons unknown. So, that about um, my last book, the fifth book of uh, Our Secret Worlds, and it tells about uh, my experiences in the paranormal, military reports of UFOs, and Finnish positive contacts with humanoids, mind control technology affecting our consciousness, and microchips and the planned future for mankind. I had this um, this lecture in, in uh, Charlottesville in Virginia in April. And uh, it says here she's a Finnish best selling author living in Norway, retired chief medical officer of North Finland Lapland with three medical specialities. Her biography is in American Who is Who in the World, Who is Who in Medicine and Healthcare, Who is Who in Science and Engineering. She's the first doctor to have published near death experiences of children in 82. In the international bestseller, There Is No Death. This book is in six languages. And you have a copy here? I have many copies. I mean, ah. in, in different languages. Can this is my last... What about this individual uh, being here? This... Uh, who am I? Who am I? I got it from... Uh, from that a photograph. Can you show any further light on that photograph? <coughs> yeah. It first appeared in Aviation Week in Space Technology. Is that correct? Uh, possible. I got this from a, a NATO officer and got permission to have it on my book, because this book is written, uh, I wrote it for males, you know. The other books are sort of uh, philosophical also, but this is facts, facts, facts about UFOs, military facts and and, and uh, people's experiences and Moscow conference. And, and what um, are those? What what precisely are those, com the details? What precisely? I was in 91 in, in Moscow in a UFO conference. Uh, which was opened by uh, General Popovich, pa Pavel Popovich, who is a cosmonaut. And the chairman of the conference was Dr. Ashasa. And I had no idea that he was the chief of, of uh, Soviet Navy's intelligence. And there were 400 people attending, pilots, test pilots, officers, and general public. It was open for anybody. And from the States, there were three people, Dr. Psychiatrist Rima Laibo, uh, an American journalist, Victoria, who is now married to Colonel John Alexander. And then that was Army's, U.S. Army's intelligence chief. Uh, Alexander, Ale Alexander being instrumental in remote viewing and Psy yes, right. War. Right. But then it was General, um, General um, Albert Stabeldine. So that kind of public for a UFO conference. And the lecturers were from Soviet Academy of Sciences, and of course pilots and radar pictures and all that. So on that level, anybody could come and listen to them. I thought that was flabbergasting. If you think of Scandinavia, you know, it's ridiculed and, and, and the highest officers would never say a word about UFOs, officially. And this is what was done, and now, in April I was in the States, and the same thing happened. I mean, it was the highest military. There were colonels, Colonel John Alexander. I wrote even a six-page article in the Finnish <coughs> magazine Ultra, which is our esoteric magazine about UFOs, over 30 years old. And uh, the title was, It's not about the lights in the sky, but the lies on the ground. And... <laughs> Can you imagine, Colonel Alexander was there, there was um, 
Edgar Mitchell. He's, of course, come out with recent statements. That's... He came out from this conference with the statesmen all over the world. And then there was um, uh, Richard Doyland, the very known historian. You may have heard about him. Uh, he talked about uh, sort of a cultural schizophrenia when it concerns UFO question. Then there was um, uh, Colonel jo uh, Jones, and Colonel Jones, Scott Jones, um, is also a doctor. They were all doctors. They all had PhDs on that level. And he was saying that maybe in two years they are hoping that, you know, the field opens officially. And Why? he mentioned... What's, what's the background to that? Well, he was saying that um, now there's enough uh, evidence, military evidence, which they can show. And he was mentioning that Norway could be one of the candidate countries where things come out. We'll see. What's the connection with Norway specifically that they would want to do that? I don't know. He didn't mention that, but I thought uh, Norway is a NATO country. And Norway is very much uh, involved with American military. So that could be that they, they use, they don't, probably they don't want US to, to announce it. So who do they come to? To an ally, maybe. Yeah. But I have no idea. Do you think there's an ET facility within Norway? At I can't US. say, but I do know that they have a lot of mountains in Norway and they have military involvements inside the mountains. And we have one of the largest harp type transmission systems That's in, right. in Norway. That's right. It's in, in, uh, outside of Tromsø, the biggest harp type of, of thing, uh, part of ASCAT system. What's uh, that exactly? ASCAT system is, is um, the system going from Tromsø, uh, first uh, Svalbard, Tromsø, Kiruna in Sweden has the headquarters of the whole system, and then in Lapland, in Finnish Lapland, in Sodankula. And, you know, when they blast electromagnetic fields, so it, it goes through, through all of Europe. And do you think that's a form of mind control? Oh, it can be used for mind control, of course, like harp. And that is the danger, because people know nothing about mind control. They don't know that your thoughts can be changed, your attitudes, your feelings. If you love somebody, somebody sitting at a computer, even through satellites, can say, okay, let's make it opposite. And you start just detesting the person who you love. You can't be in the same room, you know, you feel uncomfortable. I think this is terrible, because you're making people into biological robots. Yeah. And then the school shootings. We've had two times now in yeah. Finland. For me, it was totally okay. clear. It's mind control. In the UK, we had Dunblane, and also we had Hungerford in the U yeah. United Kingdom. It's it's clear. It's it's totally clear. They they pick out young men who have troubles, maybe psychological troubles, because that's a good camouflage. And then they start beaming of a frequency of hate, a hate, hate, hate. And all of a sudden, you know, a, a normal man, young man, becomes just a monster and shoots school children, teachers, whatever, and then it's Delta programming shoots himself. Yeah, to because because then you can't. Uh, There's no evidence. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's no evidence. The same thing happened in Nepal. You know, the, when the crown prince uh, shot the whole family, the king and the queen, and all all the sisters and brothers and cousins. And always there's one question: Who benefits? Yeah. Who benefits? The brother of the king was out of town, became king. Now he's out, which is good. But who benefits about the school shootings? If you think of Finland, in European Union, Finland was the only country who voted against uh, restriction of, 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 of guns. guns yeah. And we are third in the world in statistics, because we only have five million people. Third in the world having more, more guns than anybody else because they are mostly uh, for hunting. Okay, we said no, we don't want restrictions because our people hunt. And since Finland says no, of course in EU it is no. Then came the school shooting. Then our prime minister said, well, we, we will make some arrangements. But that wasn't enough. Then came the second school shooting, one year after. Then he said, now we will restrict. So it's always a political reason, and in the first school shooting, uh, NATO's uh, Secretary General came next day on a visit to Finland. They're trying to push us into NATO uh, for various reasons. 1,700 kilometers common border against Russia. I mean, you can build a lot of shields. 
Right. So, you've had certain things disappear in your home. You just mentioned uh, when we first met that you had uh, a set of car keys were left behind. Can you get explain more about that? Well, when I started going public, which I've been doing for uh, 20 years or something, then things started happening. I mean, all of a sudden, I come when I moved here, <clears throat> one week after, I came home and I looked around and all the carpets that I had here were not here. They were taken somewhere else in another room. So somebody had been here. But that's very blatant. That's huge. Yeah. Then, of course, they just showed that nothing was gone. No money, no nothing. No, no jewelry was gone. But the carpets were... <laughs> then, next time, the furniture was replaced in a different position. So they wanted me to understand that I'm under surveillance. And I'm a Finn living in Norway. Um, so can you show us those keys? Uh, well, the latest was now when, uh, when I was uh, <clears throat> out some time ago. I came home. All of a sudden, they had left on the table this it's um, car keys for a Volkswagen. I don't know a single person. They try to scare you. I've been. They tried to run over me by car. They they um, hit me unconscious, even in the streets in, in in Oslo. They've done all kinds of things, but they haven't killed me yet. No, no yet. Well. Well, let us sit down. Okay. Well, actually, it started when I was 15 years old. Uh, I went into parapsychology because I had a, a relative who said in three previous lives I'd been married to my husband, who was a, a medical doctor. And I said, what? Three previous lives? We only have one life. I was innocent and I didn't know. But I got interested. I started uh, reading anything in the 50s that Finland had in the libraries. And then uh, when I became chief medical officer of Lapland in 75, I joined a meditation group. And yes, I, I started reading uh, anything that in Finland you could find in the libraries. And in 1975, when I had read enough, I thought, I joined a meditation group when I uh, became chief medical officer of Lapland in Rovaniemi at the Polar Circle in, in north of Finland. And there I became an automatic writer. I sat there in the group for three years. Nothing happened to me, but everybody else seemed to develop. But I felt like I would have had a spiritual sauna. You know, I went there tired after the work and I came, you know, out just vibrating. Until one day, we were meditating, my hand went out and started doing the figure eight. I couldn't understand, so I, 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 I tried to get it down. I couldn't, there was a force. And I took the other hand and I tried to put it down. It didn't go, and then I thought, ah, this is automatic writing, sign of eternity. And I said in my thoughts, right into the air. What happened? My hand stopped and started writing into the air. Block letters. S-O-L-V-E-I-G. Sulve. And it dropped. And that was the name of my relative who had died two months previously, who, when I was 15 years old, said, in three previous lives I've been married to my husband. I was shocked. And then after the next week, I took a pen and a pencil. I thought, if this happens again, and sure enough, my hands started going. So I, I said, go and write. I had pen, pen and a pencil. And um, it wrote the whole name, Sulve, with the last name, I am alive. I mean, come on, she had died uh, two months before. And I thought, this is weird. Next time, the same thing happened, and then it was religious text. God is love, and I'm not religious. Maybe a little bit spiritual, but not religious. And I thought, what is this? So, what's going on? You're going to write a book that's called There is No Death. And I thought, well, what, is, what is this, you know? And then also, you're going to Malaysia. Now, I didn't even know where Malaysia was. Why would I go to Malaysia? And I thought, this was weird. Anyway, two weeks went and I was at a meeting in Helsinki uh, for the National Board of Health. They came into the lecture room and they said, Dr. Lukan and the Finnish Red Cross is calling. They want you to, to, to come to the telephone. And I went and they said, look, we need a medical advisor immediately. Can you leave for Malaysia? 
You know, I just dropped. I thought, gee, I said, oh yeah, I got this information two weeks ago. They said, no, no, the Telefax came from Argentina today. I said, I have it in writing. So I went back to, to, um, to, uh, to Rovaniemi and went to our, our group and I said, what am I going to do? And my hand started writing again and said, don't worry, we'll take care of it. I said, okay, fine. Because I didn't dare to deal with these energies because I didn't know what it was. And so I, I left for Malaysia, for Kuala Lumpur, and in two weeks the Swiss ambassadors asked us uh, Red Cross ladies for a smurgos board, for a lunch. And there comes a lady sitting next to me saying, I'm Gina. I said, I'm Rauni. And uh, the first sentence she says, would you like to join our group? I said, what group? Well, we're a group of seven uh, Chinese ladies and we're developing our psychical abilities. I sat there like, you know, don't worry, we'll take care of it. And I joined the group and I, I continued writing and got instructions. And my <coughs> writing was once, your book is already written on this level, on the other dimension. Give your hand and give your time. And that's when I wrote the book, There is No Death, in 24 hours when I counted together all the times. And uh, it's an international bestseller in six languages, has sold 170,000, uh, which is enormous for a Finnish book. But I was told in writing it's going to be a, an international bestseller. Well, I have a friend who is a journalist and <coughs> it was interesting that she got engaged. And I said, what can I give you as an engagement uh, present because you have everything? And she said, give me rights to your book, to your manuscript. And I said, wow, just here, take it. And that's how it was published, with a very, very uh, known uh, publishing company in Finland. How was it received? Was this new knowledge something that was... <clears throat> well, it became, uh, how would I say, the discussion of books that year. It was 82, 1982. And at the same time, it was published in Sweden, because they had, I had had some um, articles uh, in, in Swedish magazines, interviews, and had mentioned it. So a publishing house from Sweden called me and said, can we have your book? But that was before I had finished it. I said, look, I'm, I'm, I'm writing my first book and it's not finished. It doesn't matter, we'll take it. It became number one um, bestseller in, in Finland. It became number one bestseller in, in Norway, number five bestseller in Sweden, and then it's also in Danish and Icelandic and uh, Spanish. And a lot of discussion because of my background. I mean, come on, I was Chief Medical Officer of Lapland. I was even... <coughs> for how, how was it received by your colleagues? Colleagues didn't actually say much. They, they just smiled uh, I'm like sure, I, I'm sure they, they talked behind my back. But one psychiatrist had called the chief medical officer of Finland and said something that, you know, she must be crazy or whatever. But I had replaced him. I had been working in the National Board of Health and for a very short time I had replaced him. So he knew. He said, just read the book. But I heard that it was forbidden in the psychiatric uh, uh, institutions in Finland. Interesting. Because if we look at Professor Mack, John Mack I know in him. the United States Yes. and the terrible trouble, I mean he was effectively yeah. put on trial. Yeah. How did you not get that kind of treatment? I don't know. I what, don't know. What was... Uh, yeah, I, one thing which I think is the difference, be, the difference between Finland and America. In America they oppose anything of the paranormal. They have their CIA doctors who have been even putting the psychiatric uh, manual for, for, for um, DSM. Diagnostic Manual for Psychiatric Disorders, and they make just about all paranormal phenomena as a sign of mental illness until 92. Even telepathy and contact with the energy of the dead was 50% of the diagnosis of schizophrenia. Now, there was so much opposition from Europe that in 1994, in the new uh, diagnosis Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, and before they had taken away that and said that uh, UFO contacts and, and the paranormal are religious and uh, spiritual problems, which they aren't actually either, but it's better than labeling a person schizophrenic. What critical thing happened in America to make that change? I think there was a lot of pressure from, at least uh, in, in Europe, um, our psychiatry professor at the University of Helsinki, who 
was also a European uh, uh, Psychiatric Association's president, said personally to me, he's retired now, Kalle Akte, he said that we are not going to take that diagnostic statistical manual at use in Finland. I said, why not? He said, it doesn't fit into our culture. It doesn't fit into the Scandinavian culture to, to make normal paranormal phenomena as schizophrenia. But it was induced. We had it. But now we are, we're going over more to the WHO uh, labeling of, of uh, diseases. So how does that affect, how have you had an influence in that with, with the, with the uh, United Nations and World, World Health Organization? How do they equate with that phenomenon that you... Uh, I, I haven't I haven't read it all because I've been retired already so so long. But it is milder, and they are, I would say, they understand at WHO cultural differences. Already in in the 1970s was in the middle or something. They made a decision, the General Assembly, that uh, so-called folk medicine should be used. Of course, in, in in Western countries we don't. We only use the the traditional schooling medicine. But thinking of Asia and Africa especially, so they use a lot of folk medicine, but they wanted that integrated into the medical profession. And I think that would be excellent. That's alternative medicine. And today it's coming up and about 50% of people in Norway and in Finland use alternative medicine. But what happens with the medical profession? We had a Gallup in 88 first, and can you imagine it was I recall, was it 64% of doctors said they want nothing to do with healing, for instance. And 13% said they would not treat patients who have had alternative you know, uh, treatment. I mean, this is totally unethical. Then a few years went and the, the figures were a little bit better, but generally it's still the same. There's a lot of opposition and I don't think it is a coincidence. Doctors know nothing about healing except those doctors who who treat patients with healing. And even uh, uh, Alexis Carell, 1912, he got a Nobel Prize in, 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 in uh, medicine. He said that the power of the prayer is as demonstrable as the secretion of the glands. I myself wrote uh, an article in 89 already with five, six pages of, of references in normal school medical research about healing which is very positive. I was <laughs> uh, representing Finland at um, the Nordic uh, chief medical officers meeting in, in the middle of the uh, 70s. And I was very surprised because I was adjutant to our uh, chief medical officer. And they were dealing with paranormal. Chief medical officers of, of, of Nordic countries. And uh, he said to me, <clears throat> well, you give the, the, the views of Finland. I said, w w what? whatever you know. I said, wow! And there I found out that the Swedish, at that time, chief medical officer was a little skeptical. The Danish was also, but Icelandic. He went full with research about that 41% 40, of Icelanders have been claiming to have contact with the energy of the dead. Can you imagine? 41%! And at that time, Diagnostic Statistical Manual said that that's a sign of schizophrenia. So, are 41% of Icelanders schizophrenic? No, of course not. Why Iceland? Because it's isolated. Today, 260,000 people. And, um, you know, it's, it's easy to, to sort of uh, do research on them. And the, the horror... Is it anything to do with the uh, volcanic activity, energies, different chemicals in the air, things like that? Could be, could be. I don't know. They call it uh, the, the island of the sagas. So What's maybe... That? What's that? Saga. Uh, it's like fairy tales or whatever. And uh, uh, maybe when people live in an isolation uh, with nature, like American Indians or the Sami people in, in, in northern Scandinavia, they, they feel the energies much better than we who live in, in cities. We, we just don't feel anything. I mean, you know, we're, we're just going like this. And Iceland, um, I read it in the Finnish uh, medical journal, and I was shocked that um, an American private company had bought the journals of Icelanders, the sick journals, medical journals of Icelanders the and they want the DNA, you know, information. Now a whole nation is sold 
to a private company who can then deal with, you know, do whatever with their DNA. What do you mean by genetic targeting or genetic tracking? Whatever, whatever. I don't know what the agenda is, but I think it's very scary. Very scary. So let us get on to how you got involved with even talking about mind control. What brought you to that point? Of well, you know, I think it? it's, it's, I, I've thought about it myself. I think it's like steps. First was parapsychology, then I got interested in, in, in ufology, and then the next was mind control. But it's very dangerous, I've found out, especially in the States, to combine mind control and ufology. Because, of course, there's spaceships. I mean, there's absolute, absolutely military, you know, films and, and, and evidence. And not only films. I mean, they have really, they have alien bodies and they have done autopsies, etc. in the States. And probably in Russia, too. But uh, there's also mind control technology, which makes people think that they have alien contacts. They hypnotize them from remote and they can see... How, do, how does that work? How, how does it, can you explain how that works? How they can do that? Uh, I'm not technically, you know, so knowledgeable, but uh, let's put it this way, that uh, through computers, and they can be directed to satellites, and they can be directed right to you. One of the things everybody has nowadays is a computer. That's right, but I'm talking about supercomputers, which have at least 180 trillion flops, floating points in a second in a second when our brain is only 5,000 bits a second. We're no match to any computer. What time are you talking about when you say that kind of figure? Uh, uh, this figure was the last one that I've read about and it's, it was about a year ago I, I found it. But I'm sure NSA, National Security Agency in America, has much faster ones. Because when they give out information to the public, that's 30 to 50 years old. But this was official, you know, source where I got that. So how do you think that mechanism works in accessing a person? Is it You're showing the picture yeah and then describe what's in the picture. Okay. Yeah it shows white vans always parked near you. Uh, neighbors are always involved uh, somehow in surveillance and harassment that's that's the routine and they can in just send... In what way send... are they involved? Do they buy out the neighbor or does the neighbor move in as a, as a person to do that? They don't move in, but they do surveillance and they report. For instance, when I have a... I, I got a long distance one hour call from Switzerland talking about microchips and, and, and uh, mind control. Immediately, somebody living close by, after I had hung up, took the car and left. I mean, I, I think it's surveillance, or at least I know that my telephone is, is uh, under surveillance. But that's the way they, they do it. And so it can be from neighboring uh, house, if you live in an apartment house, from neighboring uh, house or, or, or a neighboring room, from the air, or from wherever, even from satellites. And how can you defend yourself against satellites? You, you were, can't. You were in a conference and you wanted to move your... Uh room. Could you go over that? Yeah, I was in England. I, I've been many times lecturing there and uh, they always place me in the corner next to the exit, you know, so that... Which um, conference is this? Uh, it was in Leeds. And so next to the exit, so somebody who wants to come in or go out can easily come in and go out. You know, they, they can access any, any... they have keys to every every single place in the whole world if they want to. So I wanted to change. I thought, hey, maybe they're doing some beaming or whatever, because you're always a target when you go out with uh, information. And if, if uh, like every time I have lectured or done something, they do something. Like they heard, sh surely, that uh, from the telephone that, uh, that I'm going to have an interview with you. What happened? I came home yesterday. My post box was smashed. Oh. 23rd time on the 23rd of January. They always use symbolism. And Why 23rd do you think, I What's the symbolism in there? What just just harassment. It's just yeah. harassment. Just harassment. And read, then then a, a friend a friend of mine who picks up my my mail said that oh once she opened it it was filled with snow. I mean it's impossible. They they filled it with snow and uh, my my uh, containers for for rubbish with snow or with uh, with uh, water or whatever, uh, 
and the people who clean up the rubbish for five weeks didn't clean up there were just you know white little <laughs> masks going around and uh, it's harassment they, they think that when you're being harassed so much maybe you will shut up maybe you get frightened I don't get frightened what? there is no death I'm not what? afraid what? of death even well I usually have only two okay and uh, number one is there is no death Man is a mind, not a body. 87% of your brain is water. 70% of your, your body is water. Even doctors forget that. What holds it together? That's energy. You are an energy field. And when you die, you just leave your body, like in outer body experiences, near-death experiences. I've written the first medical uh, uh, um, article in a Finnish uh, medical journal about near-death experiences in 1983 already. So you are absolutely an energy and if you believe in Einstein, energy doesn't disappear, it only changes form. So you leave your body and you look at your body and if you can't come back, you're dead. You've trained in doing that? You've yes, I, I, I'm not trained uh, well, by anybody you? but I train myself. And, um, and um, it you was... Had a, you have a nice story about that. Yes. Actually, it was in, in Rovaniemi, it was November, and it was dark. And I thought, well, I'm going to now try, because I had read books that you concentrate your energy from your feet and from your uh, arms towards your heart and your brain. So I concentrated. And all of a sudden I started feeling vibrations in my body from feet up to the head in five, six layers. It was just like vibrating. And I thought, this is strange. And then a blackout. And I don't know if it was one second or a hundredth of a second. Blackout. I was floating above my body. In the same position, which was funny because I had my knees up. You know, in the same position. And floating towards the ceiling. Of course, I had read about it. Out of body experiences and how people, you know, experience it. But I was looking down at my body and I thought, hey, wait a minute. I could see that my body's breathing was very slow. I worked as an anesthetist, for instance, so I can count 60 seconds in, in, in without a clock. So I started counting. And I saw that my physical body was only breathing 10 times a minute when normal is 20 times a minute. And then I got worried and I thought, hey, what's the pulse? So I took the pulse of the physical with the astral body, which was, you know, floating, and I started counting. It was 32 instead of 60, which is normal, you know, when you're resting. Then I really got worried. I thought, hey, am I going to die? Is that body going to die? All my thoughts were in the astral body. Nothing was in the body. It was just like, you know, old clothes. And when I thought, oh, am I going to die? I thought, oh, mother, mother, help me. And my mother lived uh, 800 kilometers down south in Helsinki. And when I said that in my mind, I was in a second in Helsinki at a big room, our, you know, where I used to grow up. And I saw my mother and I saw my niece who was about five years old. They were chatting. I couldn't hear what they were saying. I was just like a, a consciousness there. And I saw my mother was sewing a, a long dress with hands. And uh, probably a gift to me or something. And then I thought, where is my sister? And all of a sudden, tick, I was at a cocktail party. I was looking, I saw my sister flirting with a family friend. I looked around, where was her husband? No place. And then I thought, oh, I want to go home. And immediately, in a second, I was again 800 kilometers in Rovaniemi floating. Now I saw the floating astral body, it was like skim milk without inside organs, which is interesting, and without sex. They don't, the, your, your light body doesn't have sexual organs or inside organs, it's just light. And then I, I was floating like this and going like this, and I thought, gee, I'm going to get seasick. And then I thought, I, I better watch out that I don't throw up on this physical body, because then, I, you know, I'll suffocate. I mean, all the thoughts were in the astral, and there was nothing in the physical. And then I tried, zoom! I went back. Whew. I was cold, I was felt, stiff. This is because you felt you were going to die. Well, uh, no, up. it was it, when I was floating, when I came back, 
I just wanted to get back to the body. I, I wasn't thinking of death at all. I wasn't because I was doing astral travel, which of course I, I had never done before. And then I just went back and fell asleep. And next morning I called my father, my parents in Helsinki, and I said, what was my mother doing at 8 you know, p.m.? Oh, I can't tell you, my dad said, because it's a Christmas gift for you. And I said, it's a long dress with flowers sewn by hand. And he said, how do you know? And I told him the story. And he said, don't ever tell anybody. And of course, I went to the Finnish press, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so you went to the Finnish press. How did they react? Well, I uh, got a lot of interviews. I uh, got uh, about 30 letters a day from people who have had experiences but have never dared to say a word about it. There was a 60-year-old uh, lawyer in Helsinki who wrote to me and said, I have had exactly, you know, that kind of out-of-body experience. I have never told anybody, not even my, my wife. Then I was married to a, a Norwegian diplomat and when uh, he knew about these things, but it took a few years before he said, yeah, when I was a child and I had 40 uh, Celsius fever, I got also out of my body. Males never dare to talk about it because officially... Well, they can officially, talk about their feelings, can they? Yeah, that's right. But officially, you know, uh, this happens to people all the time. There's nothing funny about it. There's nothing abnormal about it. If you have an accident, you get out of your body. If you don't die, you come back. And within the medical profession, that's a much more widely known phenomenon. Now it is. For 30 years ago, it wasn't. Near-death experiences were not. You know, it was... And yet people have it all the time. And if you take any uh, average doctor, they still don't know enough about it. They don't. Because they believe in diagnostics that is still manual for mental disorders. Which is crazy. It's normal that we can do that because we are energy. And when you said what five or whatever <clears throat> are most important points, so at least this there is no death is absolutely the most important. You cannot die. And paranormal phenomena are normal. They are totally normal. They're part of, of our, our development, our spiritual uh, entity. There's nothing crazy about it, even if... So can you expand on that exactly? Well, what, what? like telepathy. Yeah. You know, the thing with mind control is, is uh, very bad because they call it synthetic telepathy. They can induce thoughts in you. They can induce um, uh, voices in your head. And of course, voices in your head, that you're crazy, yeah. you know. They can do that, and they have done that from, at least officially, uh, from the Iraqi First War. They gave orders to soldiers straight into their head. Of course, they were Ameri guinea pigs. American soldiers? American, yeah, right. And if this, this did technology... They the, did they use it on the, uh, on the enemy to, as well? Yes, in a way, because uh, I always remember I was so shocked when I saw... Her. So a uh, picture when, uh, when um, soldiers came uh, from bunkers, Iraqi soldiers, they had bunkers and about three uh, yard uh, walls, you know, they had drinks and food for six months. They had, Americans had um, sent helicopters above and they had Arabic speaking uh, uh, interpreters who spoke Arabic to them and they were sending with microwaves orders to come out. They were being mind controlled. And all of a sudden, all the guys came out. With no reason at all. Nobody attacked physically. It was just done with mind control. Then they had another one where there was an a, a Iraqi colonel who was, you know, putting his hands up because they were using mind control on him. Nobody shot him. He came out and he was saying, you know, I, I, I surrender. And there was nobody to surrender to because the helicopter went up, went by. So it's incredible things you can do, and especially, well, this is, this is a weapon, an incredible weapon of war. And in 1991 too, it was in Fort Bragg, uh, there was a, an American colonel who, who gave a lecture about this, and it was publicized, and, and they call it synthetic telepathy. But then, of course, there is normal telepathy between animals and humans and humans uh, to, to other humans and especially if you are close to somebody like a mother and a child you know there's so many stories of how, how they know what happens to the child on the other side of the globe for instance an accident and the mother you know feels it and, and things like that 
So this is not anything abnormal. It's totally part of being a human being. And then we come to the most important question, I think, it, why are we here? What it is to be a human being on this planet? Why are we here? Why are we, some, some are brown, some are yellow, some are white, whatever. But we all have teeth and we have hair and we have five fingers. Why are we so scared when somebody does not have teeth, not five fingers? I'm talking about aliens. There are very, very, very many different races in the universe and they don't look all like us. And why we're so afraid is that we are always fixing ourselves into the body instead of the energy. And you see the energy through the eyes. I mean, you look at anybody into the eyes and you, you feel. That's what we should do with all ETs and all life forms in the universe because we're so limited that we think that everybody should be like us. We say there's no uh, life on some planets because there is no water, because there is no oxygen. We need the water and oxygen. The races that don't. But we say you have to have this. So let's, let's split the real aliens from the fake government aliens. Yeah. Can you discuss more about the, the sort of fake MyLab aliens right. first and then we'll yeah. go on to the yeah, other? Um, I've written in my last book, uh, Secret Worlds, um, because I get a lot of, of, of mail from people who have contacts. And uh, they always say that it's, it's, it's a relieving to be able to talk to somebody who doesn't ridicule. And the Finnish contacts, in general, are very, very positive. They're very positive. They come at nights, they, they kiss you on the cheek, they talk with you, they take you up, they don't uh, harass you or do anything bad. Now, in my mind, the question is, is this real? Because this could be also done with mind control. Now, how can you separate the two? Can I would name, only say... Can you name any mind control projects that would be able to do that? Uh, I have a whole list I can show to you in, uh, okay. in, a, in a minute. It's a one page. Of course, they tried with uh, Makultra, Naomi, and all these when that was already in the 50s. But uh, they are doing it. What names again? I didn't quite catch that. Like Makultra. That was the MK Ultra, yes. Yeah, MK Ultra, MK Naomi, Rainbow, and whatever. But I have a whole list uh, written yeah, down. Okay. And, of course, if you think what the technology was in 1950s, think what it is 2009. A lot happened in the 50s or the late 40s. Where A lot, think I it think, was, was remote, uh, remote, I mean, uh, when they got crashed UFOs, when they got alive aliens, they got information. How and long do you they think are, that's been going on back to the 1930s? Probably, but I was just in, in uh, near Washington D.C. in April uh, 2008 at uh, this uh, X conference, second insiders conference, like they called it, and there was uh, Jesse Marcel, and uh, her, who is a doctor living in Montana, and and uh, he's a uh, a colonel, retired, and his father was the the, the Jesse Marcel senior who at Roswell took home a piece of, of this uh, well, piece of our UFO and showed it to the son who was at that time 11 year old and said you look at this because you're never going to see it again and he drew the 11 year old Jesse Marcel Jr. drew the figures that were there they were like hieroglyphs and he also in his lecture showed pictures from 1800 end of 1800 of UFOs and from uh, from the US, uh, UFOs from from 1932. And as you know, generally they say, oh, it was 49, you know, with Kenneth Arnold. The official information is often lies. Unofficial. The, the Kenneth is... Arnold thing is a lot of that's been suggested is actually a lot of German World War II technology. And in Sweden, Foo Fighters. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's been going on like that. So in your position in Finland, you've been to Russia. Yeah. for some conferences. Can you uh, yeah. talk about some of those? Well, I went to um, I went to Siberia, Novosibirsk, and that was interesting because it was Arctic Medical Research. And of course I was with Arctic Medical Research uh, in, in, in Finland and in the, in the Nordic Committee for Arctic Med Medical Research. And one thing that really got me was that there was um, 
uh, Dr. Kashnashev, I think his name was, he was doing research with bacteria and their consciousness from one file to another. Something was happening to the bacteria here and the bacteria here, you know, was reacting. Which is interesting when you think of telepathy, consciousness, whatever. So the bacteria have a consciousness of communication? Well, I mean, communication. Yeah. Communication. So if you think that we are a little bit more advanced than bacteria, so we have tremendous energy and possibilities for communication. Normal telepathic communication. Can you discuss anything about the Soviet research into psychic phenomena or anything like that? The Soviet Academy of Sciences officially has been for decades researching the paranormal. Of course, because it is a weapon also. And uh, in this conference in Moscow, uh, there were members of the Soviet Academy of Sciences who gave presentations. When was this conference? It was, it was in 91, 91 in Moscow. And uh, what surprised me most was that they were so open about the research. And now how did you get to this conference? It, because of, I knew, I knew the, the psychiatrist Rima Laibo from a previous conference. And she was uh, telling me that she's going to this Moscow conference. And I said, is it possible that I could come? Because I was in Finland, it's you know, a short trip. And she says, yeah, it's, it's open, just come. So I just hopped on the plane and came. It was that easy. It didn't even cost anything. It was free. And does there... That, does that tell you about they were really trying to tell us something, a yeah. disclosure? Yeah, I, I, I do, do think so. And there was an assistant professor and this was, so, of course, just before the uh, Soviet Union collapsed. So yeah, it was just about a minute. last uh, gasp it, before. It was, exactly. And that energy that it was going to collapse and something new coming, it was there. It was incredible energy in that, you know, 400 people in, in, in the lecture room. And, and who, were, who, who were the type of people there? Uh, I mentioned they were pilots, test pilots, like Marina Popovich, as, as um, you know, um, audience, uh, doctors, and... One thing that came out, and, and general public, I didn't know the general, you know, I don't speak Russian, unfortunately, but then there was a lady who, I, who was an engineer whom I had met in a UFO conference um, previously, so I asked her to come and, and sit next to me and interpret something, you know, anyway. And um, then the next day was very strange, because she didn't come, but two men came. I've been married to two officers, so I can see their stiff neck and their, you know, I said, um, what happened to make that change? I don't know. Did she but tell you something? Or? It, uh, in my mind, they, they realized that uh, I was a foreigner, of course, and, and, and they, they wanted to sur do surveillance. I said to the other guy, when the other one went out, um, you're an officer. And he was like, how do you, you know, I said, I can smell them. I know. What is your grade? Colonel. And, and this uh, gentleman who just went to the toilet. Uh, he's my chief general, of course. They were audience. And after that, I couldn't go anywhere alone. They said, oh, no, no, we'll, we'll escort you to the hotel and whatever. Which actually was good because I was alone in Moscow and I, you know, I didn't think anything could have happened. So I was grateful for the information. But uh, Marina Popovich, whom I had met also before, ex-wife of uh, General Popovich, who opened the conference, we made a deal that we'll, we'll talk tomorrow. She never came. Somebody must have interfered. I don't know. But the best thing of that conference was that there was an assistant professor, Russian, who is also going to the committees in NASA. And he gave a lecture about UFO contacts, positive ones, and near-death experiences, and what happens... So you're having a Russian expert who deals with NASA yeah. giving positive... Uh, very right in Moscow. In Moscow about UFOs. And near-death experiences. How people change positively after a good UFO experience and after a good, uh, good near-death death, death experience. And the changes are permanent and they are the same. They're the same. And I thought this was incredible. I had come to the same conclusion myself. But hearing it from the podium in Moscow, you know, I thought this is fantastic. You don't hear this in the States because, like you mentioned, you know, what's the difference between Finland and the US? Well, we're allowed to, you know, <laughs> say what we want and we're not harassed. 
you go to the States or NATO country Norway, you harass terribly when you open your mouth. And that is why you har harassed here? That's right, this day. Because, because of the information I give. And my information is all uh, public. I mean, I have no secrecy, no secret, nothing. But there, of course, a lot, there's a lot of, of work digging into ex old top secret papers, which are now open because of Freedom of Information Act. And what are you getting from those papers? For what information? Uh, number one, that uh, people are not told the truth. People are being lied to. I mean, that's the, the whole thing. So the lies are? On the ground. And official information is mostly lies. So what is, what is real? We're talking about the real ET situation at the moment, right? Yeah. What is real is that we're not alone in the universe. That's my number two. There's no death and there's alone in the universe. I mean, when you go to an observatory in any country and then you see the little tiny spot which is called planet Earth, and then you see the universe know it, but as we know it, and then you can't come out saying that, ah, oh. you feel like, mm -mm, so I may be an ant to them. Before, or Russia, and this mm. Russian Republic, has, have you had any further contacts with Russia since no. then? Uh, no, any, that was, no, that was, no, it. that was it, that was it, that was it, yeah. Was collapsing. Yeah.